doctor in the TARDIS. Next stop everywhere. Welcome back to the seventh anniversary episode of Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skeggs, back in the TARDIS once again, and I'm really glad to be spending this very special episode with someone who I consider to be very special, one of our special guest companions, and just all around wonderful person that never fails to brighten my day, Holly Mack. How you doing, Holly? Doing well, and thank you for the welcome. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. So here at episode 239, Holly and I are going to be discussing Asylum of the Daleks, which is um, one of the episodes that I'm really surprised that no one has picked before now. So congratulations, <laughs> Holly, I... on picking this thank first. Thank you, because it was just like I was looking through the list and like I swore Asylum of the Daleks had been done, and then I, I right. scrolled and it's like – it's still available. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get locked in before it went bye bye. Right. This is one of those that, that just stood out on my list of episodes we still haven't covered on mm-hmm. Next Stop Everywhere. So, so I'm really glad you picked this one because uh, this is a fun one to talk about, fun one to rewatch, and yes. I think it makes it kind of special. Even though you know it's a little weird for me because Jesse Jackson, my partner in time, isn't here for mm-hmm. this seventh anniversary. Because, uh, you know, he and I kicked off this whole thing back way, way back in 2014 on August 3rd. Oh, wow. 2014. So we are just two days after that. Here wow. as We're recording this on August 5th. Happy birthday. And here's to seven plus more. Seven plus more. So only, uh, what, 239 more episodes to go? Woo. All right. <laughs> But we got some big news this week, didn't we, Holly? Yeah. Yes, we did. Yeah. This is, a, so I thought we should talk surprising. about that right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. A little surprising, but then again, not quite. Right. I mean, there's been rumors circulating about this for a while now. But one of the things I thought was surprising about this news is that, you know, obviously the big news, of course, is that Jodie Whittaker has been officially confirmed as leaving mm-hmm. Doctor Who in 2022, in autumn 2022. So we have her for another year, at least, as the 13th Doctor. But the surprising bit of news that I thought was interesting was that Chris Chibnall is also leaving with that episode. Yes. Yes. So did that surprise you too? Wasn't just me? And that surprised me with the double whammy. I was more expecting Chibnall instead of Jody right. as leaving. And it's just like with the two of them leaving, it's just like, oh boy. Because I mean, I love Jody Whitaker. I would have loved to have seen her do one more season yeah. with a different showrunner. Because we even brought this up on the Five Ish Fangirls that. Jody did good, but the writing I don't think did her any justice. I it's just yeah, yeah. it's too bad. I mean, Capaldi did fantastic because mm-hmm. I know some of the writing was a little iffy even with him, and he was able to. I just think Jody needed another year under her belt and a different showrunner, and I think we would have <laughs> yeah had a little more. Oof. Right, right. I think I think you know I, I'm with you because I think a lot of people would have liked to you know it's that it's going to be one of those what ifs that mm-hmm. what if Jody Whittaker stayed another season and had another showrunner like you're talking about because I know there's a lot of fans out there that that aren't satisfied with the kinds of scripts we're getting from Chris Chibnall mm-hmm. and yeah. his, and his team 
So, yeah, I mean, you kind of wonder, okay, what would that have been like with a different showrunner? But for me, you know, it, 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 it seemed a little weird because, for one thing, you know, Russell T. Davies, he had the ninth and 10th Doctors. Mm-hmm. So he got two Doctors under his yep. era. Stephen Moffat had the 11th and 12th Doctors in his era. So that's another yep. two Doctors. But Chibnall is only, you know, staying with just Jodie Whittaker's era. Mm-hmm. And then he's now he's leaving. So I'm kind of, I was kind of surprised that, you know, I, I thought for sure Chibnall would stick around and there would be a new doctor. Uh-huh. But maybe there was pressure behind the scenes. I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. That's you were, you're kind of reading my mm-hmm. mind. Like maybe he wasn't in a certain way. Maybe he was asked to. Uh, yeah. Uh, why don't you relinquish? <laughs> Right. You know, he did make this statement as like, well, Jody and I made this pact. You know, this is this mm-hmm. was the official press release that, you know, when I was reading off of BBC News mm-hmm. and he said, Jody and I made this pact that, you know, we would just do three years and that's it. So three years, I guess, meaning three seasons, perhaps. But probably because, yeah. because you know, she Jody started in well, she debuted in 2017 on Christmas Day. And she's going to be leaving right. in 2022, so of autumn. So that's close to five years, really. Right. And yes. Jo- time wise, and Jody. Time wise, yeah. So really, but as far as seasons go, it's only been three, which right. probably says a lot that even, well, understandably with COVID and the pandemic, Chibnall was only get, able to get three seasons of Doctor Who made in five years. Right. Mm-hmm. And I know the ratings have been down. A lot of people kind of tuned out. Enthusiasm has yeah. waned. So, yeah, I, I kind of wonder if the BBC did kind of maybe say, you know, okay, we'll do another s- season with Jody and you, but you're going to have to leave at the end of it. And now they're trying to kind of put a positive spin on this saying, oh, yeah, we just made this pact together that we were both going to leave right. at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, to be fair, there could have been a pact for all we know. We don't know the full details. Right. Exactly. Benefit of the doubt. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt here. But I do, it, it, the timing seems really odd. E- exactly. It's suspicious. E- yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am all kinds yeah. of sus about this. Yeah. I, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> all and right. Go ahead. Now, for all the other fans that are complaining, when we get a new doctor and a new showrunner, mm-hmm. I do not want to be hearing bring back so and so this <laughs> better than this producer better than this doctor enough i'm getting tired of that cycle <laughs> you're making us other who fans look bad you know obviously i've been a, a doctor who fan for a long time i've seen a lot mm-hmm. of strange stuff and mm-hmm. i'm thinking this one's taking the cake <laughs> to paraphrase han solo and mm-hmm. it frustrates me every time that you know that you're bringing this up that when fandom decides, oh, we need to bring back David Tennant as the Doctor. We need to bring back Max Smith as the Doctor. And they don't really get, at least, you know, some fans don't really get that these actors have moved on with their lives mm-hmm. and their careers. And they're not coming back to the show unless it's like maybe part of a reunion special, like the Day of the Doctor. Right. And, you know, we had we do have the 60th anniversary coming up in 2023. So mm-hmm. um, hopefully Jody Whitaker will return for that if they yes. decide to do something. But, you know, it just it gets very frustrating because, you know, they Doctor Who is always moving forward. We're never like as much as I would love a Paul McGann Doctor Who season unless yeah. they did a spinoff. Yeah. I, I, you know, set in the Doctor's past. I cannot mm-hmm. see them doing that on the main Doctor Who series. No. And then the, then the whole wrinkle with Big Finish mm-hmm. and all the spin-off series, audio series that McGann is doing for them. Right. Then we get into a little dicey territory. Yeah. Yeah. So these announcements have come out. It's official now. Joey's leaving. Chris Chibnall's leaving. So how many episodes do we get before Jody leaves? So I was reading the article, I was studying, you know, trying to parse the language because that's what I do. Mm-hmm. And yep. I try to analyze and try to figure things out. So what it seems to me is that according to this article on BBC News' website, we're going to get six episodes in 2021, a six-episode event 
the which was originally supposed to be eight episodes. So the remaining two are going to be carried over now and become specials in 2022. We're going to get a new another New Year's Day special, which I'm sure is going to infuriate Jesse Jackson because it's not. <laughs> Not a Christmas episode, once again. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to get another one, the second special, in spring of 2022. And then Easter Sunday. Exactly, an Easter special, kind of like Planet of the Dead, remember? Back during mm -hmm. David Tennant's season of specials. And then Jody's last episode is going to be an autumn special. So we're getting six episodes in 2021, then three specials in 2022. And then that will be it for her era. So it's going to be, needless to say, we're going to be filling in some gaps once again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're really good at that here at Next Stop Everywhere. Yes, you guys We've done are. it for seven years, so mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're kind of pros at this, I think. But what do you make of all this, you know, all this news that we got this week? Uh, t you know, taking it in, digesting it, mm -hmm. I'm, it's going to be interesting to see the six episode intertwined arc to see how that goes yeah because i mean i know the two parters didn't do too <laughs> good the past couple of seasons so hopefully with this interconnecting it'll be okay i kind of like interconnect i thought spyfall was pretty yeah good. yes I mean, I don't know how interconnected it is it going to be. Is it going to be like Trial of the Time Lord, or are we going to be doing like a key to time thing, which you know yeah. kind of had a bit of connector? I think I think that's the one so. that's, that this model is going to probably follow. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing because yeah, you know, like you mentioned, you know, in the classic era, we did get seasons that had an overarching theme, like you mm -hmm. said, in season sixteen. Of classic Doctor Who, we had the Key to Time saga in Tom Baker's era. And then Colin Baker's revamped season 23, his final season, we got the Trial of the Time Lord, which we've talked about mm -hmm. here. And um, so I guess I get I kind of get the vibe that we'll probably get something a little similar to the Key to Time where they'll there will be kind of running threads. And maybe mm -hmm. some recurring characters. So, but but generally, presumably, the the main story in each episode will kind of be a self-contained, only you know, maybe with some connecting scenes to kind of you know, because because there are supposed to be cliffhangers with each okay. with each episode. So maybe there will be you know just things to link the episodes together somehow. I don't know. We'll find out, I guess. Yes. We'll, we'll all find out together, but we'll, yeah. see what, we'll see what we get. But. And release date TBD. Yes. That was, what, I think was one another frustrating thing. We did get a, you know, the last time we, since the last time we talked, we did get a, a teaser trailer as yes. part, as part of the San Diego, San Diego Comic-Con at home, at home panel, which interestingly, they said nothing about, Jodie Whittaker or Chris Chibnall leaving during that panel, which is which is really odd because you think the announcement that they'd make is right. that, but I think they don't want to overshadow the quote unquote premiere, right? The, the trailer, yeah, no. trailer, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, it just seems a little so kind of burying the lead both ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you know it was interesting because they, all they did was release a teaser trailer, which is like all of sixty seconds. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really even a full trailer. We didn't get a series thirteen premiere date, but you know, mm -hmm. we did get to find out later in the week, though, that Jody and Chris are leaving. Chris Chibnall. So yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> watch this spot. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, we when we find out about it, we will share this with you. So keep yes. following our Facebook page, Next Stop Everywhere, Doctor Who Podcast, and also on Twitter at Next Stop SMG for more Doctor Who news. So stay tuned, okay? We got you covered. We'll find out. You'll know when we know, okay? All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any further thoughts about this, or are you, are we ready to talk Asylum of the Daleks? 
I think I'm ready to talk Asylum of the Daleks. All right, let's do that. So, like I said, here at episode 239, Asylum of the Daleks, the first episode of Series 7 from 2012, written by Stephen Moffat, the previous showrunner, directed by Nick Heeren, who's a notable director. If you've, I'm sure a lot of people are fans of his other stories for Doctor Who, including The Girl Who Waited, The Angels Take Manhattan, and The Day of the Doctor. Maybe you've heard of that one, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, pretty solid director, and no surprise, does a great job here. And this, of course, stars Matt Smith as the 11th Doctor in his final series, Karen Gillan as Amy Pond, and Arthur Darville as Rory Williams, who almost becomes the ex-Mr. Pond. Yeah. In this story. Mm -hmm. This close. This close. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. (laughs) We'll get to that. Yes, we are definitely going to talk about the Ponds. Yes, we are. Guest cast this time. There's a very interesting actress. Maybe you've heard of her. (laughs) Jenna Louise Coleman. Now, of course, she goes by Jenna Coleman now. She dropped the Louise. But at this time, excuse me, she was called Jenna Louise Coleman and plays a character named Oswin Oswald. Hmm. (laughs) Little familiar to Clara Oswald. But at this this Uh point, at this stage of the game, we haven't met Clara yet. And this was an interesting way of introducing Jenna Coleman as Clara, although technically she's not really Clara in this story. Right. Yes. But she's obviously, in addition to Clara, is notable for playing Queen Victoria on the series Victoria, which I highly recommend. It's a very good series. Mm -hmm. And she's going to be playing, and as a Sandman geek, I'm very jazzed about this. She's going to be playing Lady Johanna Constantine, or Constantine, depending if they use the British pronunciation. And the Netflix adaptation of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman is going to be coming out in 2022 as well. And now, if you're not familiar with Lady Johanna Constantine, well, shame on you, because she's the ancestor of John Constantine. (laughs) So this should be, I thought it was pretty intriguing casting. Yes. But uh, we'll see how that plays out. She, She does, you know, Jenna Coleman can do a little bit of a darker edge. So, mm-hmm. so we'll we'll yep. see how she does. Um, um, and we always know that we we do know that she looks great in period clothes. So. Yes, I mean her little blink and her it blink and you miss cameo in the uh, Captain America Winter Soul. Yes, <laughs> yes. Or, or, the the first, Winter first, or first, first Avenger. First, first, Avenger. first Avenger. Yeah, yeah. She's the for those who aren't aware. Yeah, she's the one that kind of um, is Bucky's date. When they go yes. to see the World's Fair. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. And let's see. We also had Anna Maria Marinka as a character named Darla, Darla von Carlson. And, you know, the one that ends up kidnapping the doctor, you know, when that mm-hmm. ice dog pops yeah. out. And she's revealed to be a Dalek puppet. She's notable because she was on Netflix's The Old Guard, based on the Image Comics series, which I recommend if you haven't checked that out. That's a fun movie. Uh, Ghost in the Shell, the 2017 version. So this is the one with Scarlett Johansson. She was also in that. So I thought I'd mention her. David Gaiassi played Harvey. He was one of the, also another Dalek puppet that's revealed, the one that was inside the Alaska Mm-hmm. And he's notable because he played a hospital patient in the Torchwood episode Combat. Okay. And he was also had little bit parts in pretty impressive resume here. The Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, Cloud Atlas, and Annihilation. So Wow. That's a pretty solid resume, right? Mm-hmm. Even yeah. though there were bit parts, but Still, you know, looks good on your acting resume, mm-hmm. I'm sure. And, of course, we have Nicholas yes. Briggs once again as the voice of the Daleks. And also mm-hmm. the voice of Oswin at times. 
as it turns out. All right. Trivia. So if you're wondering about, okay, there was references to various planets where the doctor encountered the intensive care doctor, excuse me, the intensive care Daleks. So I thought I'd run those down really quickly. Okay. So if you're wondering what those planets are, um, those intensive care Daleks are survivors of previous encounters with the doctor on Aridius, which was from the chase in the William Hartnell era in 1965. Kimball, which was from the Daleks master plan that aired during, during 1965 to 66. Vulcan, no, not the Star Trek Vul- planet Vulcan. <laughs> This is the Doctor Who planet Vulcan. Completely different. Um, You have to keep that straight. In Patrick Trotton's first story, The Power of the Daleks in 1966, Spyrodon in the John Pertwee era in Planet of the Daleks in 1973, and Exelon in Death to the Daleks in 1974. Also from Pertwee's era. And we also got a great cameo... Um, a nice little Easter egg for yours truly because we got the special weapons Dalek. Yes. Who mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of from the Sylvester McCoy story. Yes. Re- Remembrance of the Daleks. Remembrance of the Daleks. Because yep. I thought, um, you know, after seeing that special weapons Dalek in, in that story, I was thinking, like, why aren't the rest of the Daleks this cool? Right. <laughs> Because that thing was I mean, pretty, that thing is the tank. <laughs> that thing was a tank, and it was pretty impressive, right? Mm-hmm. That's something to be afraid of, you know? This, yeah. And so it's like, why didn't they make more of these? I kind of wondered about that. Probably couldn't levitate as easily as the others. <laughs> maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, one other bit of trivia that I wanted to mention, although stressing that first syllable of exterminate, Sounding like eggs was new to television in uh, Doctor Who television. It was not the first time the notion appeared in Doctor Who, interestingly enough. It was actually originated by Doctor Who writer Paul Cornell in, you know, the guy who wrote um, Father's Day, for example, or, uh-huh. hum- or Human Nature. He, uh, he wrote a, a Doctor Who comic story called Metamorphosis. That was featured in the 1993 Doctor Who yearbook, which I'm holding up Ooh, right now. Nice. Right here. I've Very got, nice. I've got that bad boy. Um, showing, just showing once again my age as a Doctor Who fan. But in this version, in this comic strip version that's uh, featured inside that yearbook, the Seventh Doctor actually is – Mentally turning into a Dalek over the course of this story, Ooh. which is a cool idea, right? And he, yeah, and he says, and it's in in the panels, eggs stir, and then and <laughs> and then the next, you know, that's the end of the that page's panel, and then the next page as you flip it is an actual Dalek crashing through the um, the airlock, so. Uh, it was a nice transition, but but yeah, the so Paul Cornell originated that, and apparently Stephen Moffat nicked it. Nice. Well, and how apropos that the yearbook cover has a Dalek on it too mm-hmm. to, to boot. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yes. You can see right here. Yep. And it's it one of, one of those remembrance of, of the Daleks. Daleks, the white ones. The yes. white. The white and gold ones, which I actually have the action figure of. Oh, cool. Right here, right? Shiny. Shiny, yeah. That's my my parliament of Daleks behind me, which obviously mm-hmm. all of you out there in podcast land cannot see, but no. but Holly can because she's special. Yes. She gets that. Now, um, before we get into our breaking down this story, I did want to mention we did get a, a little bit of a prequel. Because um, if you remember yes, that is right. back in the day – uh-huh. They did these little things called mini zodes. Mm-hmm. I kind of miss those. <laughs> I do too, right? I thought they were kind of a cool idea, so that you know, if you, you know, you could, you could, during the day they would release these things on the internet, and so in, 
while you're pretending to work, you can watch these things <laughs> and watch a little bit of like brand new Doctor Who. And it was, you know, it's only a few minutes long each, but, mm-hmm. but in this one, I just thought I'd mention, uh, there was a prequel to Asylum of the Daleks. And in, in the, in, in this prequel, a hooded messenger informs the 11th Doctor that a woman named Darla Van Carlson requests his help for her daughter. And the messenger provides space time coordinates, which turn out to be the planet Scaro, home planet of the Daleks. And the mm. 11th Doctor is like, Scaro, why did it have to be Scaro? Mm hmm. So, yes. All right. So I just thought I'd mention that. All right. Three topics today. This should be pretty simple to break down, mm. but there's a lot going on. So yes. first topic, let's talk parliamentary procedure. Get it? Parliament of the Daleks? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, parliamentary procedure. That's what I was going with. So we're going to talk the Doctor and the Parliament of Daleks. And let's also throw in the Dalek puppets as well. Sure. Because this is another, this is a new story Dalek concept. That yes. Stephen Moffat and brought a to little the table. creepy to boot. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, what did you think of the Dalek puppets first and foremost? That was surprising because all of a sudden you hear this neck crink from Darla, and then all of a sudden you see the eye stalk pop. I was like, "That's new, <laughs> little creepy. I like it, but it's just like, wow, they've upped their tech, right?" <laughs> Yeah, so these little sleeper agent Daleks, apparently, mm-hmm. which is kind of a creepy yeah. idea if you think about it. Yes. Maybe they, maybe the the Daleks saw what the Cybermen were doing by converting humans, and they're like, yeah. maybe we should get on that, but let's put a little different spin on it. Let's but, disguise ourselves a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, they could be camouflaged as regular people, and mm. then surprise, Daleks out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the Doctor and the Daleks as well as these Dalek puppets. Um, the Doctor, you know, picking up from the prequel, the Doctor's on Scaro. He's confronted by this woman named Darla, who tells her a story about a man who fought the Daleks. But the universe now believes him to be dead. And Darla hopes the rumors are wrong and that this man will come to save them. Meaning, of course, the Doctor, right? Mm-hmm. And we get to go to Scaro. You know, we we see this really ginormous statue of a Dalek, which I have. I'm trying to picture the Daleks actually creating. You know, yeah. Apparently, there are like Dalek artisans somewhere. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> but as we find out through the course of the story, well, you know, they do have a concept of beauty in their own Dalek yes. way. So maybe, I guess. Yeah. And so, um, but Darla, as it turns out, is a Dalek puppet. And uh, so it's obviously, this is a, turns out to be a big trap to kidnap the doctor and bring him and his companions to, um, before the Parliament of the Daleks, who are aboard, I guess, this spaceship orbiting this Dalek asylum. And as we, you know, the the gist of this is, is that the Daleks apparently want the Doctor's help to get through this force field that's surrounding this Dalek Asylum planet, which houses the, like, the most, like, damaged, um, potentially dangerous, unhinged, you know, probably... Uh-huh. The PTSD Daleks, I guess. Right. And, and so there's a chance that they could break out of this planet, which apparently freaks out the Daleks. And, mm-hmm. and um, so this is why that apparently the, they decided they need the doctor's help. Yeah. <laughs> and decided, kind of reminiscent. Go ahead. Kind of reminiscent of Shada with that, with the one prison and yeah, a little bit, a <laughs> little bit, yeah, yeah. Although, um, you know, we're talking about um, 
uh, Skagra trying to break it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah trying to break yeah. into that. So, because um, it turned out to be a Time Lord prison. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but this one, you know, this one is essentially, you know, the, the Daleks don't want to deal with this. So they're like, okay, we'll get the doctor to do it. And then, oh, by the way, the doctor's supposed to have companions, so we'll kidnap them too. So we kidnap, so they kidnap Amy and Rory as well using other Dalek puppets. Right. So what, the so, what, is, so what did you make of all this, this, um, you know, the, the Dal- this plan of the Daleks to get rid of this, this threat? It's, they created. Nice. It's a nice idea. Uh-huh. Planning. Probably about 95%, but it's just like, why? The doc, you're asking the doctor to destroy this. Uh, why? You created the problem. You're mm-hmm. all powerful too. I mean, just blast well, to, the blast away and be done. <laughs> well, I think, I think they were thinking, well, we can't get through the force field. So we're going to send you down there. Right. Somehow getting through the force field. And the question is, why, you created the force field in the first place. Right. So right. wouldn't but, you have the... <laughs> but apparently the force field can only be switched off from the inside, which makes zero sense. Yeah. So that's a slight design flaw, I have to think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just slight. Yeah. Like, so you didn't think to like, okay, we need it. We need to be able to disable this if we can't shut it off. Okay. Certain exhaust port on a certain other yeah. spaceship. Right. Yeah, you know, uh, I guess they were hoping that the the doctor would be able to bullseye, womp, you know, uh, <laughs> like womp rats on on uh, Tatooine back home. I don't yeah, or Gallifrey mm-hmm. back home. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, a two meter wide port, that kind of thing. But yep. All right, yeah. just below the main port, of course. Mm-hmm. So, yep. so, we, so the dog. Yeah, they're just like okay. Send the doctor down there, and mm-hmm. you you switch it off, and then we'll take care of the rest. We'll blow it up if you can switch it off for us. Right. And and, and what's not to say I'm not going to get exterminated in the process of trying to help you guys because they aren't going to know you sent me for help. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. And so yeah, go down to all this planet of the crazy Daleks and um, turn off this forest field so we can blow up the planet. And uh, if you don't do what we say, you know, we'll just kill your companions. But we're going to send your companions down there with you so they can Mm -hmm. get killed anyway. Right. Or this is we ask you for help. Mm -hmm. You get rid of the problem. And then if the end result happens to be you and your companions get killed, more the better. Hey. Right. (laughs) Well, win, I, win. I, I was going to say, I think they figure it as a win-win, right? So, if, yeah. if, you know, if the doctor gets killed, awesome. Mm-hmm. If the doctor succeeds and turns off the forest field, then we could just blow up the planet. Oh, and hey, we could just blow up the planet with him on it, right? Uh-huh. Yep. Although the doctor ends up checkmating them later <laughs> by teleporting out before they could blow up the planet. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, but uh, one of the things I thought was interesting is the uh, while the doctor is trying to digest all this, he learns that the Daleks didn't dest- de- didn't destroy these insane Daleks because they find destroying their quote unquote divine hatred offensive. They describe it as beautiful. So, okay, so apparently. Mm-hmm. Insanity for a Dalek is mm-hmm. is a good thing, I guess. You almost yeah. you almost expect them to form their own political party with thinking like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially in twenty twenty one. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um. So let's see what else. Then that one Dalek from the uh, <laughs> the two parter with. The pig Dalek. Uh, oh, he would yeah. fit in just fine. You mean the uh, evolution of the Daleks? That one. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Daleks in Manhattan. That one. Yeah, I remember. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's it kind of funny, you know. 
we didn't get to see the pig Dalek or, you know, the pig. You know, no, no, we didn't get to see that guy. We didn't get to see the guy with a kind of, um, uh, Oh, the, the squid like head. Yeah, the, yeah. 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 With a little, uh, uh, uncomfortable looking tentacles. Yes. <laughs> Which kind of look like something else. If you're mm-hmm. a little bit, um, yeah. you know, twisted like me to think about that kind mm-hmm. of thing. All right. So, uh, anything else about the the Daleks or the Dalek puppets before we go? Uh, just when they got into the asylum, they're Amy, Rory, and they're just like, okay, yeah, yeah. What, what it's it, and then they see, oh boy, yeah. a whole bunch of Daleks. Well, one of the things and I love. The go ahead. I'm sorry. Chorus of and then in the chorus of save us. I mean, when the and eleventh Doctor just kind of squinting his eye, one eye opens like. That's new. I was thinking to yeah. myself when I first watched, it, like, yeah, that's new. Usually, it's the exterminate, exterminate. <laughs> Doctor has been located. <laughs> that's something I forgot to ask you. What did you make of this episode the first time you watched it? It was, oh, I mean, it was jaw dropping. I mean, it was a perfect season opener mm-hmm. that you could have asked for just with the stuff that we're going to talk about with Amy and Rory, and then just seeing all of those Daleks right. in that. I mean, when you saw that and then you look up and it's just like, oh, crap. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you think about it, this is the – of all the stories that Stephen Moffat had written for Doctor Who up until now, mm-hmm. he'd never written a Dalek episode. No. So this was his, like, okay – I'm going to do finally do a Dalek story and he threw everything in but the kitchen sink. Yeah. All we we got yeah. everything except for Davros. So Right, yeah. <laughs> but um so he had to have a lot of fun with that because obviously being a Doctor Who fan himself, he I'm sure he mm-hmm. really enjoyed that. One of the things I really enjoyed about this, you know, the going down to this Dalek asylum. I love the look of it. I love the shadows. Oh, yes. It's so Mm -hmm. atmospheric and creepy because, you know me, I'm on record. I love me my creepy Doctor Who. The creepier, Mm -hmm. the better as far as I'm concerned. So needless to say, I was happy with this story. So, you know, they get down there. You know, it's just – it feels very claustrophobic. It feels – you know, with all the shadows, it's like anything could just pop out at any moment to attack you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they're, they're essentially walking through what is almost like a minefield of Daleks. Right. You know, they go from room to room. There's various Daleks in there, and some of them, you know, may not engage them, but right. others And then may. poor Rory <laughs> yeah. hitting hitting the one bomb ball, picking it up and hearing right. the eggs, and it's like, he picks it up, you want your egg? I'm just like, I'm thinking to myself, Rory, that's right. not an egg. <laughs> Drop it. Run. That's right. a bomb. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I almost expect him to go, like, you dropped your ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. You want this? <laughs> yeah, you, you want to play fetch? Go on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else about the Daleks or the Dalek puppets you want to talk about? Uh, I think I think we got it covered. <laughs> okay. All right. Topic number two. This one I wanted to call, I don't have a husband. Ouch. Yeah. So this is obviously, I want to talk about Amy and Rory on the rocks. Their marriage this close to ending. Yeah. Because, because Rory comes to deliver divorce papers for mm-hmm. Amy to sign at her during her modeling shoot. And apparently in between the wedding of River Song and at the end of series six, in this episode, the beginning of series seven, the pawns have kind of fallen on hard times. Mm-hmm. And, Cue the Neil Diamonds, Love on the Rocks. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it almost gets a little country and western with like D I V O R C E. <laughs> yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, this is something that 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 really kind of bothered me. Yeah. And I don't know about you. What, what, was, when, what was your reaction to that? Uh, when, you know, he comes in with the divorce papers, I'm just like, whoa, back the truck up. What in the heck happened? I mean, yeah. Rory and Amy are like the OTP couple right. of 
Doctor Who. And it's just like, why in the heck are you splitting them up? And, you know, and I'm kind of thinking back, okay, yes, the thing with the baby and trying to find her, you know, pressure with that, okay. Right. Yeah, but, and then not talking to each other probably didn't help matters any. (laughs) Well, you know, and and we do get a reason, thankfully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, that's explained. It's a very understandable reason. Yes. But, uh, But before I get into that. Um. Yeah, this. I for, personally, I was like, I was the first time I watched this. I was like, Muffet, what are you doing? Yeah, you no. Know, why are you tearing? Why? Them up? Why are you busting <laughs> this couple up? And mm-hmm. I was hoping, okay, yeah, it's just going to be a momentary thing. They're going to, you know, and sure enough, it was. So yeah, patience, Thank pays, <laughs> patience pays off, mm-hmm. especially with Muffet. But but initially, I'm just like. I'm not really digging this. this I didn't uh-uh. I really didn't dig the animosity. No. These uh-uh. characters, because we know how much L- Rory loves Amy. He, he waited for her for 2000 years. Okay. Yes. Something he brings up in the course of this story. And mm-hmm. we know Amy finally got it in her head to like, give up the doctor and, and marry commit to Rory committing to their yep. relationship just in time for the wedding. But yes, she got there. Um, so it just, it, it really bothered me, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, like they're making snide comments, you know, Rory's, you know, putting, you pouting know, at the camera. Pouting, comment. Yeah, yeah. He makes a comment about that. And, you know, then, the, then by this point, you know, they get taken by their Dalek puppets. Like, you know, I guess one is like an assistant that um, kidnaps Amy. And then the other one is like a bus driver that kidnaps Rory after he gets on his bus. Yeah. And then, you know. yourself, Rory. The next time you get on a bus, look to see how many people are there. If it's empty, just take the next one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, they're there. And, you know, Rory wakes up in the cell uh, with uh, Amy and there's like a small window. They realize they're in space. And then the doctor mm-hmm. walks in at this moment, at this moment, escorted by Daleks. So you're like, okay, what's up with this? Is the doctor been kidnapped too. And this is where the doctor makes his line about, you know, like on a scale of one to 10. One to 10. Yeah. <laughs> and this is going to be 11. Get it? 11. Yeah. 11 uh-huh. Doctor. doctor so, yeah. Yeah. So, and nice little nod to Spinal Tap, too. <laughs> right, right. Turning it up to 11, yeah. To 11, yeah. <laughs> so, so they get down to the planet, and obviously they get separated. Rory, you know, Amy is found quickly by the doctor, but Rory has been teleported, fallen down, I guess, into the asylum. So mm-hmm. he wakes up like fumbling around in the dark in the Dalek asylum. So poor Rory is already thrown in right in the middle of it. And they're having to wear these bracelets because as it turns out, um, the Daleks have invented this kind of nanotechnology where if you're not wearing these protective bracelets, there's like little nanites hovering around in the air that could af- affect you with some kind of Dalek virus and turn you into a Dalek puppet. Like poor Lovely. Harvey, like poor Harvey above the, you know, aboard the Alaska. So, mm-hmm. so that's going on, which is nice, right? This nano cloud. <laughs> now we do, you know, this is one of the things I did want to talk about. I want to get your thoughts on this. Rory ends up giving, offering to give Amy his bracelet because hers gets taken from her. Mm-hmm. And he makes this statement that it would essentially take longer for the nano cloud to transform him into a puppet because since it supposedly transforms love into hate, he would last longer because he's always loved her more than she's loved him. Which I would argue, yes, yes, that's the case. Uh huh. Yeah. He, he's not wrong about that. No. And but, but then I go ahead. Oh, go ahead. 
Maybe. You could also argue that because of all the animosity and that that was going on, mm-hmm. would he get trans? Would he get transformed faster right. just from his anger at the bringing the divorce papers and yeah. throwing in the towel when you could kind of tell he didn't want to? He was more doing it. Hey, this is what she wants. I'm going to give her what she wants. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think his anger comes from frustration. Mm-hmm. Because as far as he was concerned, everything was going good. And until, I guess, Amy's behavior must have changed. And the reason we find out that happened was, you know, we get confirmation that Amy was left sterile because of whatever the silence and Madame Kavarian did to her at Demon's Run. Mm -hmm. So, which is horrible. For Amy. Yeah. Understandably. And as a result, Amy trying to cope with this trauma of realizing that she can't give Rory another kid, you know, right? because, well, their their previous kid gets to grow up to be River Song. Um, She knew she she makes this comment that she knew that he always wanted children, even when he was a kid. And so she essentially gave him up so that he could have a better chance. So it's almost like this gift of the Magi kind of thing where, Mm -hmm. you know, Rory's willing to give Amy what she wants so that she can have a happy life, even though he doesn't want to let her go. He's agreeing to go ahead with this divorce. But Amy is trying to give Rory up so that he can have a better life. Mm hmm. And so what did you make of all that? It was emotional. It's It was both what they needed to hear as just like, why couldn't you guys have sat down and talked about this a little bit sooner? But mm-hmm. then, of course, that's not the way it works. That's Moffat being Moffat, and the only way that's going to happen is right. let's throw you in danger and... I mean, Amy can tell that the doctor is sizing things up. He knows something is off and fishy and him trying to play marriage counselor. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I think Amy, you know, she has a hard time opening up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she tries to, she tries to mask her feelings, I think, a lot. You know, she, you know, she, she's. She has feelings for Rory, but, you know, she's, you know, too busy trying to, like, live out this fantasy. And so, you know, with the doctor. And so, consequently, she doesn't really get – I guess she's not very introspective. No. So – Or she didn't want to appear to be – by admitting that that she's weak. But, no, that takes strength to say, hey. Right. This is what happened. Right. And I'm sure Rory would have understood. Oh, exactly. So I'm sure he would have been very sympathetic and supportive. But so it kind of frustrates me that Amy wouldn't know that about Rory. Yeah. And as a result, their marriage almost ended because she Mm -hmm. was afraid to open up. And it's only because of their circumstances here for the course case of the you know the the story's purposes that she opens up and because mm-hmm. of their being thrown together one last time on an adventure and um being in these dangerous circumstances the truth comes out and uh, mm-hmm. it's made for a very powerful scene and i thought yes. hearing gillen and arthur darvel did a really good job with that oh yes so yeah exactly yeah, and as it turns out, of course, the doctor placed his bracelet on Amy, so Rory didn't need to give up his bracelet. No, yeah, they... and when Rory realizes that, there was a touch of jealousy there, yeah, right? Just because it's just like, oh, great, we're going back to when we first met. She's. You know, the doctor's trying to hone in and mm-hmm. aim, you know, just like, oh, great, I'm going to be the third wheel. But then I think he might have paused momentarily and it's just like, wait a minute. Yeah. He's doing this for me, 
so we can try to work things out. So I think that anger was really fleeting, and I think he realized what the doctor's true intentions were. Yeah. Were. Well, because he knows the doctor better by this point. Like if it, if this yes. had happened during series five, mm-hmm. um, I don't think Rory would have understood. At least not until no. you know the Vampires of Venice, mm-hmm. where the doctor was coming from. But now he, you know, he's traveled with the doctor some time by this point, so he understands the doctor a little better, and then maybe he's a little more trusting and of what mm-hmm. the doctor's motivations are. He knows that. Well, maybe the doctor doesn't have an ulterior motive here, and he's not going to just assume, you know, the, that. I mean, I'm sure there's probably a little bit of that jealousy that he's, he's he's probably very sensitive to that. You know, like if he sees something that, oh, the doctor's trying to you know move in on you know my wife somehow, that he's going to get a little jealous. But but it, uh, but I think he's more trusting. He's more willing to give the doctor leeway. At this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So uh, they end up kissing, of course, Amy and Rory. And, of course, this is the moment where the doctor arrives and they need to teleport out of there before the Daleks blow up their planet and the planet that they're on. And, uh, you know, it's like they always pick the worst times to kiss. Yeah. And they But they teleport out just in time. So they end up going back to the... the Dalek's parliament ship. And, um, you know, then they, they essentially, uh, they go back and, and, uh, then after they leave the Dalek parliament ship, um, Amy and Rory get dropped off at their house and Amy smiles to Rory and essentially, you know, takes him back inside and uh, there's a fun little scene where Arthur Darville's kind of like, yes, I'm back in the house. And mm-hmm. Amy's like, I, you know, I can see you, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. So. Anyway, so so we came very close to uh, break up with the ponds, but not quite. Yes. Not quite. So a little scare for everybody, for all the shippers mm-hmm. out there, I'm sure. All right. Anything else about Amy Rory you want to talk about? Uh, just glad that they were able to patch things <laughs> back right. up. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. very, very relieved. All right. Topic number three, final topic. Run, you clever boy, and remember. So <laughs> this is the big, the big meat of this episode. The Doctor yes. and Oswin Oswald. This, who turns out to be a very enigmatic character through most of this episode. This woman that um, somehow has survived, supposedly, um, uh-huh. after the the, sh- the starship Alaska crash lands on the Dalek Asylum, supposedly has survived for a year, fending off Daleks and whatnot, uh-huh. and is making soufflés. Interestingly enough, uh-huh. or at least tells the doctor yes. that she's making soufflés, which adds to uh-huh. the mystery, especially when the doctor points out several times throughout this episode, where do you get the milk? Right. So what did you make of what did you make of Oswin? Very interesting to begin with, you know, when I first saw it, but now kind of knowing what I know now, it's just like, okay, with this Oswin, mm-hmm. how far back in the timeline is this version? Is this, you know, a spinoff or a different incarnation of yeah. Clara from after after she leaves the 12th Doctor and goes running about in time with me? Or... Or, <laughs> or some combination in between. Yeah. Because it was, to put this in perspective, historical perspective, when this episode aired back in 2012, Jenna Coleman had been announced as the new companion, taking over from Amy and Rory. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a big surprise when she all of a sudden, Jenna Coleman turns up essentially five episodes early. Right. Um in the story 
And so me watching this for the first time, I was like, you know, like everybody else at this point, I was like, what, you know, how is she here now? Right. And why is she calling herself Osmond? I thought her name was Clara and, or going, it was going to be Clara. So it's all these big mysteries and Moffat, I'm sure had, was delighting in the fact that, you know, he's making all the fans guess about what's going on. Well, I'm going to pull a fast one on him. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, pretty <laughs> much. But, um, but it did give us kind of a preview of how good Jenna Coleman was going to be as Clara. Yes. So, um, even though, you know, obviously I think a little bit, you know, Clara is different character than Oswin. I think Oswin is more, um, mischievous. Yes. You know, a little bit, you know, sassy. I mean, Clara mm-hmm. is sassy at times, but I think, um, but I think uh, Oswin was more so. And I kind of, you know, I really yeah. kind of, I liked Oswin. And then was, that was another frustrating thing about this, you know, because through the course of the story, you really get to like Oswin. And you're like, yes. and you're like, okay, at least I was. I was like, okay, this is going to be a great yeah. companion. Let's make her the companion. And, mm-hmm. but of course, Moffat being Moffat, he's going to stick the knife in your your side and twist it with this big reveal that, as we find out to everyone's horror watching this for the first time, that Oswin is actually a converted human or human that was converted into a Dalek mm-hmm. and is in complete denial over this. So what did yeah. you make of, what did you make of that twist? That was, that was a surprise. It's just like, wow, there really wasn't that much, Right. There wasn't, I mean, there were probably were little nods here and there if you were really paying attention. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, from what she was looking out of, but, you know, it's like, okay, she could just be trapped inside some sort of, you know, like a one of the Dalek statue, statue yeah. type things, one of the prototypes. So, you know, I didn't put it past, you know, I didn't think anything of it. Like, could she actually be a Dalek? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the way this is shot, that Nick Huron shot this. Essentially, you get the vibe that she's in some kind of almost like a little apartment somewhere. Right. Apartment or a prison that was modified yeah, right. to make her comfortable. So you're like, OK, well, did this asylum have like uh, human operators or whatever? You know, like, you know, and then why is she you know, wearing able to why does she have an apron and, and why is she where is she getting these souffles from or making these souffles from? So. It was very puzzling. And then you thought, okay, well, you know, maybe she's a captive of the Daleks somehow and need to be liberated or, you know, maybe she used supplies from the, the Alaska, perhaps, and set up, a, you know, like a little, you know, she'd been there supposedly for a year. So you figure, okay, well, maybe she just made herself a little home hiding out from the mm-hmm. Daleks all this time. But nope, it was all in her mind. And... Um, you know, after hearing her voice, like the, the, the doctor only gets to hear her voice. He never gets to see Oswin. So he's a little, he's, you know, the doctor being the doctor, he's, he's kind of adding up all these little things along the way and Mm -hmm. coming up to this conclusion, which much to his horror gets confirmed once he goes into the room that Oswin is supposedly in only to find a Dalek instead of a human there. And, um, and then, and then we, we get the realization that Oswin is in complete denial that she's a, she's a, actually a Dalek now. And she still thinks she's human and is all insistent. You're like, I am not a Dalek. I am not a Dalek. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just this horrific panic setting in. Right. And then we get that call back couple seasons later when Missy traps Clara inside yes. the body of a Dalek. And gee, who wrote that episode? <gasps> Stephen yeah. Moffat. Stephen Moffat, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Stephen Moffat has some kind of fetish about turning Jenna Coleman into a Dalek. I'm just saying. Yeah. It's his little, it's his thing. He's got some weird little fantasy going on there. I don't know. But, uh, 
but yeah, just I thought it was such a powerful reveal, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, and ultimately though the doctor gets her to accept her current state, and Oswin, you know, much to the doctor's relief, probably um, says that you know she's. She's insisting that, you know, she may be physically a Dalek now, but she mentally she's still human and she wants the doctor to remember her. And um, the doctor thanks her for her help. And then, you know, um, as as the doctor teleports out of there with Amy and Rory, Oswin leaves the doctor a little present because when they get back to the Dalek Parliament ship, the doctor finds out that this moment earlier in the episode where Oswin um, temporarily, or I guess, erased the memory of a, of a group of Daleks of the doctor so that they wouldn't attack him. Well, apparently that erasure has now been spread throughout this, this, um, this web, this path web. Not just to the dogs in intensive care, but to the entire species, because they're all linked. So now the Daleks cannot remember the Doctor. They they literally say Doctor Who, mm-hmm. and the Doctor finds this insanely amusing. Yes. Any thoughts on uh, on that scene? Just. It was it was brilliant. It was like, uh huh, yes, <laughs> when you, you did it, right. thank you. So, and then we just get that line of the you know, run you clever boy and remember. It's just like, hmm, right. if that's not saying something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the doc, you know, after he drops off Amy and Rory, the doctor is like, you know, whooping it up in the TARDIS, you know, going. Doctor Who, Doctor Who, mm. Doctor Who, and then we lead right into the the closing credits. So yes, it's like you can celebrate now, Doctor, but don't celebrate right. too much. Right, <laughs> right, right. All right. Uh, anything else about this episode? We talked a lot about it. So uh, anything we missed? Fan- I don't think so, but a fantastic, I mean, a fantastic opener and a great start for what the season is to come. Good start to send mm-hmm. off Amy and Rory and introduce right. Oswin soon to be Clara and just hit the ground running. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought so too. I agree with all of that. All right. So do you have any favorite quotes? I know we we talked a couple. Um, kind of the, yeah, the, so how much trouble are we in? How much trouble, Mr. Pond? Out of 10? 11. And then I'm kind of paraphrasing. It's when they're trapped on that ice planet. Like, yeah, Amy says something about, you know, four situations. You can count one of them out. Yeah. (laughs) Down to three. And then. And then her little running commentary with the doctor, you know, it's like, he's scanning the room, he's looking <laughs> around, seeing the distance between us, knowing something's wrong between Amy and Rory, adjusting the tie, how is he going to fix this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the things, um, one of the things, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the, what kind of trouble are we in, you know, the, the you know, on a scale 1 to 10, 11, I was I I thought it would have been funny, you know. I was doing thinking about this during my rewatch, that you know that that scene where the doctor, you know, he, he says, you know, on scale one to ten, Mister Pond, eleven, and then I envisioned like, what if he was like wearing sunglasses, or you know, put the <laughs> yeah. sunglasses on, and, you know, like kind of like, like David Caruso, yes, like David Caruso <laughs> on CS, Miami. CSI Miami, and then we go, yeah. That would have been brilliant. Oh, because that was such a, a Caruso like uh, line. Yes. Right. Hmm, Moffat, what were you watching during right. your downtime when writing right. this? Was there was there a marathon right. on somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> Eleven. Yeah. 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 So, anyway, that's just me. 
Q um, a who a who a fied version of the right. Doctor Who opening theme song credit. <laughs> Doctor Who Miami. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, my favorite lines: the Doctor saying, "You're going to fire me at a planet. That's your plan. You're going to fire me at a planet and expect me to fix it." Why? Yes. Yes, we are. And let's see, Oswin and Amy. I thought it was good. Where Oswin mm-hmm. says, Do you know how to make someone into a Dalek? Subtract love, add anger. Doesn't she seem a bit angry to you? And Amy replies, Well, somebody's never been to Scotland. <laughs> I've been to Scotland, so I can verify that. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. And lastly, I'll say the Doctor and Oswin talking about the intensive care Daleks where the doctor says, what's so special about this lot then? Oswin replies, dunno, survivors of particular wars, Spyridon, Kemble, Aridius, Vulcan, Exelon, ringing any bells? Doctor replies, all of them. Mm -hmm. Oswin (laughs) says, yeah, how? The doctor replies, these are the Daleks who survived me. Yeah. yeah, and I've got yeah! kind of one. No, just yeah, <laughs> and I kind of got one more. It's you know they're asking the questions to Darla, and Rory goes like, "What color?" Right, and they all kind of look at him. Sorry, there weren't any good questions <laughs> left. <laughs> poor well, Rory. sometimes color depends on how you need to handle these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought, was, I thought that was funny. I thought that was a good one. Yeah. All right, so what's your rating for this story? <sighs> Nine out of ten bow tie maneuvers. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, we are in sync, believe it or not. I am rating this a nine out of ten as well. I'll go nine out of ten souffles that were too beautiful to live. Ooh, nice. Thank you. Why it didn't get a ten out of ten was because of the Amy and Rory tension. That's yeah. what wrote yeah. it down. Yeah, if we wouldn't have had that much tension, it would have been a 10 out of 10. Yeah, I think so. I think so. It's not a perfect episode, but it is a very, very strong episode, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, I'm glad you agree with me on that. All right. Uh, reverse the polarity. So we're going to reverse the polarity, the neutron flow. Um, back to, if you like the sound of the Daleks, I recommend... Going back to 1967 for the evil of the Daleks, or the, the evil of the Daleks, the ninth serial from series, or excuse me, season four in 1967, really written by Dalek creator Terry Nation, and this is a story that's actually in the process of being animated. And okay, I knew one of the yeah it's one this, of the missing Daleks ones was. Yeah, gonna this, be. this is the one they just announced is going to be coming out uh, as an animated, reconstructed episode or story. Nice. And this is one I've been waiting for a lot. So uh, it loves me some animated trout and to replace the, or, you know, repair, reconstruct those missing mm-hmm. episodes. So I'm looking forward to this. So eventually we're going to be hopefully talking about this on Next Stop Everywhere. But yes. in the meantime, as we wait for that to be released... The story in 1966 London, set right after the Faceless Ones, the, which was another one that just got recently animated. The second Doctor and Jamie watch helplessly as the TARDIS is loaded onto a lorry and driven away. The trail leads them to an antique shop written run by Edward Waterfield, who sells Victorian-style antiques that seem as though they were still new. Investigating the store, the Jamie... The Doctor and Jamie succumb to a booby trap that gasses them, and they're dragged into a time machine by Waterfield. Not the TARDIS. Different time machine. They wake up to find that they've been transported to 1866, 100 years earlier, and are in the house of Theodore Maxtable, Waterfield's partner. The two have been trying to invent a time machine using mirrors and static electricity. I want to know how that works. Because uh-huh. um, needless to say, you know, it doesn't seem to be working for me to make a time machine, but okay. Uh-huh. When the Daleks emerge from their time cabinet, 
the Daleks took Waterfield's daughter, Victoria, who's a very important character, as it turns out, hostage, and they forced Waterfield to travel from one century um, to the next to lure the Doctor into a trap by stealing the TARDIS. And this is the main connection to Asylum of the Daleks here, that the Daleks threaten to destroy the the TARDIS unless the Doctor helps them by conducting experiment to isolate the human factor, the unique qualities of human beings that have allowed them to consistently resist and defeat the Daleks. So we have the Daleks requesting the doctor's help, only this time they're kind of forcing him a little more coercion, but you know, it's the Daleks. They never just ask nicely. They always have to coerce. No, no. So once the Doctor has isolated the human factor, he will implant it into three Daleks, who will then become the precursor precursors of a race of super Daleks with the best qualities of humans and Daleks. The Daleks want the Doctor to test Jamie by sending him to rescue Victoria, who is being kept in the house. Jamie rescues Victoria as, as uh, hoped, but she's taken prisoner again wah, wah, and transported through the time cabinet. The doctor, observing how Jamie accomplished the rescue, distills the human factor, but continues to harbor suspicions that there's more uh, to the experiment. And once the human factor is implanted in the three Daleks, they become completely human in personality. The doctor's intent was human. the human factor would lead to human Daleks being friendly to humanity. And he christens them Alpha, Beta, and Omega. But they soon return uh, through the time cabinet cabinet to Scaro. So we also get Scaro as another connection here. Jamie, Waterfield, and the Doctor are locked out of the time cabinet, but manage to use the Daleks' own short-range time machine to make the journey to Scaro before a bomb destroys Maxtable's house. The trio find their way into the Dalek city and are brought before the imposing Dalek Emperor, who reveals the true reason behind the experiments and the capture of the TARDIS, that by isolating the human factor, the Doctor has succeeded in isolating the Dalek factor as well. The Daleks will use the Dalek factor, these qualities that make the Daleks relentless killing machines, to reconvert the human Daleks. In addition, the Emperor wants the Doctor to use the TARDIS to spread the Dalek factor throughout human history so the Daleks will become human and rebel against the Emperor. So there's a little bit of a Dalek Civil War thing going on here. Uh And the Emperor calls for his black Daleks as the rebellion spreads and the city falls into chaos. Edward Waterfield throws himself in front of a black Dalek blast meant for the doctor, sacrificing himself. The doctor promises that Victoria will be taken care of and Waterfield dies content. The doctor tells Jamie that they would be taking the now orphan Victoria along in their travels and they watch the Dalek city in flames as the Civil War continues. The doctor pronounces that this is the end of the Daleks, the final end. No, really, really it is. It's the final end. However, a pulsating light is seen coming from the Dalek Emperor at the end of the episode, indicating that the Emperor Dalek is still alive. Dun, dun, dun. Mm. So, so maybe Rory's question about what color Dalek helps right? some water. <laughs> maybe. You think? You think? All right. Listener feedback. We obviously are not going to get Holly's because she's here enchanting all of us as my special guest companion this week. But we did get Dave Proctor writing in. So hi, Dave. Yay, Dave. For appreciate, hey, Dave. Your, appreciate your writing in. He says, hello in the TARDIS. Well, hello, Dave. Pretty good episode this time around. When you brought up this episode last show, I was confusing it with a different story. Amy and Rory are two of my favorites, and I did not care for the time that they were apart but that does add a lot of depth to their relationship. It makes them seem more like regular people than just stand-ins for the audience. I like that the doctor is a little bit moody and clearly doesn't want to keep coming to the rescue of helpless humans or any other race of the universe. 
I don't think he's opposed to that. He always does that. However, if you make an interesting enough problem, he's in. This is much like Sherlock Holmes, at least in the Sherlock series. Well, hey, Stephen Moffat was behind that, too, so. Yep. <laughs> uh, the Souffle Girl is an interesting peek at a future companion that I liked. I do not think she always had the best writing, but this ties into when she splits herself throughout time to save the doctor. That's one thing we didn't mention is mm, that that's um, right. I completely forgot about that. Right. Because we find out that Oswin was actually one of the splintered time versions of Clara when she went through um, this uh, little timey wimey thing at the end of the name of the doctor. Uh-huh. You know, that's where we find out that she got sent throughout the doctor's timeline. So it just so happens, poor, poor Oswin, this this splintered version um, becomes a Dalek, sadly. Um, bad luck of the draw, I guess. So Dave continues, I hope I have it right, and I assume that is what's happening here. Yep, you do. When it turns out she cannot leave because she is a Dalek, at least physically, I like that she deleted the Doctor from the Dalek's database. His character needed a little restart because he was becoming the universe police. I have to give this story nine mysterious cosmic sources of milk. So Dave's right along with us on this one. Have a great couple of weeks. By the way, your guest co-host last week was pretty good. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, well, that that Charles guy wasn't too bad, but, oh, oh, you mean you, Dave? <laughs> yeah, Dave was pretty, <laughs> Dave was excellent as always, yes. So, yes, he was. And I can't wait to have him back on the, po- the podcast to talk more Doctor Who, of course. All right. So, thank you, David K. Proctor. Thank you, Dave. And uh, if you want to be like Dave, and of course you do, or you want to be like Holly when she's not here with us, Write to us, next stop everywhere, smg at gmail.com. That's next stop everywhere, at smg for Southgate Media Group at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Twitter, at next stop smg on Twitter. Facebook, of course, next stop everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. Or Instagram, at next stop everywhere podcast. And Holly, when you're not here talking Doctor Who with me, or Torchwood, or anything else, uh, where can we find you? Well, you can find me as one-fifth of the Five-ish Fangirls podcast. You can find us at our website, thefiveishfangirls.com, and on Facebook. And you can find our links there. And you can find me personally at hollymac underscore 79 on Instagram and Twitter. All right. Well, of course, as for me, um, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Facebook, or at Charles Skaggs on Instagram. It's very convenient that way. Or you can find me on my blog of Geeky Things. Damn good coffee. And hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on Next Stop Everywhere. Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sergey Adventures, Big Finish Audios, and more. All kinds of comic book news, sci-fi news. News of my other podcasts for Southgate Media Group, including the Phantom Zone podcast, where DJ Nick and I just recently wrapped up Loki. Had a lot of fun with that. I know, Holly, you and the other fangirls have mm-hmm. discussed the finale on the Fighters Fangirls yes. podcast. I still have to listen to that, so I'm behind. Yes. But I'm looking we forward to your the, review. We cover the whole season of Loki. <laughs> yep. Well, we did that on, on the Phantom Zone as well. We broke it down by episodes, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a lot of fun. A very, And if you're a Doctor mm-hmm. Who fan, I definitely recommend you check out Loki. It's very timey-wimey. Yes. So uh, you ought to you ought to tune in and then check uh, check out the Fire Fangirls and also check out the Phantom Zone podcast as well uh, if you want to learn more about Loki. And then um, we're going to take a little bit of a hiatus because DJ Nick and I are going to be moving over to Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, because Titan season three is starting up here in a couple weeks, probably less than a couple weeks now. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. Now that the show's coming back to HBO Max and going to be reopening Titans Tower at long last. So everybody, if you enjoyed us on the Phantom Zone, please come over and hang with us as we discuss Titans Season 3 on Titan Talk. And then also 
Ghost of the Twin Peaks podcast, where my wonderful co-host, Dan Sprouse, whom you've heard here on Next Stop Everywhere, and I are trying desperately to record our 100th episode, <laughs> hopefully tomorrow, fingers crossed. Fingers and, crossed, where you Fingers yeah. crossed. And joining us t- tomorrow as well, hopefully, DJ Nick is going to be joining us for our special 100th episode, his first time on the on Ghostwood, as we're going to be discussing the European version of the original Twin Peaks pilot, which mm. was re- released on home video because they, uh, they decided to, the, you know, back then, back in the 90s, you know, VHS rentals were really big, right? You know, mm-hmm. remember Blockbuster Video back in the day? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what they did is they came up with, they had David Lynch shoot like an alternative ending, which is about like roughly 15, 18 minutes worth of additional footage. And they kind of tacked that onto the end of the pilot and kind of made a TV movie out of it that was used for home video and also overseas. So we haven't really watched that. We've discussed it a little bit, but we haven't done a commentary for that. So we're going to be doing commentary uh, of that European pilot. And Nick's going to be watching along with us. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun as we're kind of going to be doing this um, cross country, this international DVD style commentary. It's going to be very interesting. We'll see if they can pull off the logistics and fingers crossed our internet holds up for that one. Yeah. So yes, we'll see how that goes, but uh, that's what we're doing for Ghost World 100. And then last but certainly not least, Drunk Cinema, where Zan Sprouse and I recently discussed Superman, one of my all-time favorite movies, and my, it turns out, both of our all-time favorite comic book movie, the 1978 version with Christopher Reeve, Margot Kidder, and Gene Hackman. We had a lot of fun talking that one. And then coming up here, hopefully next week, we're going to be discussing Hot Fuzz. We're going to be completely switching gears. And so we're going from the superhero genre in the 70s to a Simon Pegg, Nick Frost comedy from the 2000s. And it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about. So hope everybody tunes in as we discuss this great comedy by directed by Edgar Wright. So if, you've, if you're a fan of Shaun of the Dead, you definitely would appreciate Hot Fuzz. Otherwise, Holly, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Really enjoy talking this episode. I hope you did as well. Yes. Oh, I did. I had a blast. This is a fun one to talk about. I mean, I, I thought this would be really easy to discuss because yes. there's just so much goodness in this episode. Yes. Chock full. Yep. And I'm glad I'm not the only one that feels this way about this. All right. Mm-hmm. So everybody check out Holly on the Five Fangirls podcast and Holly, hopefully you'll come back soon here on the podcast. I know we're, we're already discussing your return. Fingers crossed. Yeah. We're, yes. plot, we're plotting behind the scenes, you guys. So yes. st- stay tuned. And otherwise come on back next time on next stop everywhere. As for episode 240, John Takis is going to be returning to next stop everywhere where he and I are going to be discussing the arc which was a much overlooked, I think, story from the William Hartnell era. Okay, that's what I I thought. John Takis loves talking the Hartnell era, and I'm certainly willing to indulge him on that. So Mm -hmm. two weeks, we're going to be doing that one, and we're going to have a lot of fun talking about it. So John Takis is going to be back, and Holly, thanks again. All of you out there in podcast land, Uh, thank you so much for listening. And stay tuned as we try to get more news about the transition, who's going to be the new doctor. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. With John Takis, yours truly, talking the arc right here on Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>